Sega, go home, Doctor Young Guts, Grant Gahaga, Niwa Gook, Majonto, At Noala, Niwa Geet Delonto. Hello, my name is Gohon Dokta. My English name is Janice Montour. I am Mohawk Nation Troll Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River. And I'm very happy to be presenting today uh, as part of the Sparks mini symposium entitled Doing the Work Toward Truth and Reconciliation. Today I'll be sharing a very important story of how Glenn Brown, the theater manager at the Sanderson Center, and myself as the executive director of the Woodland Cultural Center, cultivated an ever-growing relationship between our two organizations. Although I don't really know if I would necessarily classify this as reconciliation, um, as much as I would probably classify it as partnership building. The story of how our two sites began working together is very interesting. And oddly enough, it took Glenn and I stuck in a car for three hours traveling north uh, to realize that we had a lot in common and ask the question, why did it take us for you know, this long to finally work together? So sometimes I think uh, partnerships in your own backyard are often the ones that get overlooked. Maybe for various reasons like people see you as competition in the arts and cultural sector. Uh, maybe you don't think that your programming really aligns and maybe you're just both really busy. I think in the case of Woodland Cultural Center and Sanderson Center, I think we were just both caught up in the whirlwind of our every day. And really, we just didn't get a chance to stop and breathe and take a moment to make the effort to visit one another. So I wanted to start uh, my presentation. I've entitled it, from Curve Lake to Brantford, how two, or two art organizations came together. This was sort of my idea of how I could address the, the topic at hand, doing the real work toward truth and reconciliation. And I was approached um, by one of the staff at Spark to speak about this relationship that, you know, was developed with a non-Indigenous organization, that being the Sanderson Center, and an Indigenous organization being Woodland, how that relationship began and how we were able to actually do the real work to build bridges between, between our organizations. So how did it all start? So I talked a little bit about a three-hour drive. Um, so this all started um, in 2016. I received a call from a colleague of mine, Judy Harkwell, and some of you may know her. Uh, so she was working on a partnership grant with the Indigenous Performing Arts Alliance, who I'll refer to in short as IPA. Um, so they were successful in bringing together Indigenous and non-Indigenous performing arts organizations from three regions in the province of Ontario. And what they wanted to really look at was, you know, an overall learning from each other and best practices, looking at policy and also looking at programming and touring opportunities for our regions and with our non-Indigenous and Indigenous sites. So the idea of a three-day retreat to come together with other Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, presenters sounded so exciting to me and I agreed immediately. So Judy informed me that I would be paired up with Glenn Brown from the Sanderson Center. Um, so he was going to be the non-Indigenous counterpart to, um, for the region that we were serving. So I did know Glenn. Um, I had met him several times, sort of one-off events, and, but I had never worked with him. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity to see where this all went. So Glenn and I connected prior to the retreat and we decided to drive up together. So after we got through sort of, you know, the introductory conversations, um, we started to really share about our organizations, programming ideas, and overall visions for the future. 
I remember at one point thinking, wow, why did it take us so long to finally sit down and realize that there was real partnership potential between our two sites? On this drive, we also shared, you know, our personal stories as well, talking about our family, our friends, um, what type of music we like to listen to. But it was really that conversation on the drive up that was inspiring. Glenn was open and he listened and he asked me some really hard questions. I was glad he did ask me those hard questions uh, because it gave me an opportunity to share. He was inquisitive about my culture and the complexities that come with that. And it was so refreshing to have someone who wasn't really scared to ask some of those hard questions, but be present and be open to hear some of those really hard answers as well. So we really built this relationship, you know, being open and truthful with one another. Um, so during the three day retreat, uh, we spent a lot of time as a group uh, sharing our various experiences, successes, challenges as presenters, um, having some of those hard conversations that sometimes separates us as non-Indigenous and Indigenous presenters. The group was amazing. You know, we, we gathered together, we were open, we really listened, and we came to the table with a good mind. One poignant moment uh, during our sharing was something I felt that I needed to tell Glenn in front of the group. And I'm not sure if he's going to remember uh, this, but it will always remain with me. So we were talking about how, you know, non-Indigenous presenters, what can they do to be more present, more supportive? And, you know, the conversation was, you know, going around the circle. And I, I looked at the group and I said, I really have to say something. Um, I have visited the Sanderson Center many times over the years, um, taking in various performances. And one thing I noticed during one of my first visits was his front of house. So one of the box office employees is actually a community member from Six Nations, so my community where I'm from. So when we're talking about, well, how can non-Indigenous presenters be more supportive, be more, you know, consultation between the sites, I, you know, I said to Glenn, I said, we're talking about what you can do as a non-Indigenous partner. And, and as a non-Indigenous partner, you should be taking action. And I said, well, Glenn, you already did take some action. You have hired a Six Nations member to work in your box office. And for me, as an Ongwahomi person from Six Nations, for me to see one of our own working in a non-Indigenous space, especially at the front of house, I said, that's huge. It makes it feel like we can go to that space. It makes us feel like we're welcome to be in that space. And I said to Glenn, you may not realize that that was a big deal, but it's really huge for us to, you know, go up to the box office, buy a ticket and see someone we know um, who is a community member and to feel like, oh, okay, we can, we can come to this performing arts space and not feel like we don't belong. And he, I remember he was just like surprised like that that was a big step and the other non-Indigenous, sorry, and the other uh, Indigenous presenters were like, yes, that's like, that's a, that's a step, that's an action that you can do to help break down those barriers between our, our spaces. And so um, I, will never, I will never forget that. And I think he was surprised um, really by how really it stuck with me um, that he did have someone um, working in the front of house. Now, and this isn't to say that Glenn at the Sanderson Center wasn't doing some other things. Like he was actively programming indigenous content as part of his performing arts uh, series. And that, which is actually why I had been to his space, but it was sort of a result of this gathering in 2016 that I'll sort of share a little bit more about our, about our partnership. 
So before I sort of delve too deep into the partnership, I just want to sort of take a step back and talk about our organizations to give you a better understanding and context for um, why our sites are different, but sometimes how they're similar. So the Woodland Cultural Center is a First Nations educational and cultural center. Uh, we are located on the grounds of the former Mohawk Institute Residential School. And the center was established in 1972 um, to protect, promote, interpret, and present the history, language, intellect, and cultural heritage of the Anishinaabe and the Ongwehome. The center is a leader in the revitalization and celebration of Haudenosaunee culture, language, history, and art. Our aims and objectives are the preservation, accurate documentation, education, and promotion of the values, practices, languages, and articles of both the past and contemporary First Nations people of the Eastern Woodland area. The center provides a comprehensive community-centered facility where local, national, and global communities, which include youth, elders, students, scholars, and Indigenous peoples, can research, reaffirm, celebrate, learn, display and discuss their culture, language, history, art, and values. Our center primarily serves Six Nations of the Grand River, Tyndanaga, Wata Mohawks, Brantford, Brant County, and the surrounding region. Now the Sanderson Center has been a downtown Brantford entertainment destination since 1919. Its magnificent design and architecture represent a remarkable past and reflect the evolution and growth of Brantford's heritage and culture today. Open as the Temple Theater in 1919, it was originally designed as a vaudeville and silent movie house. The grand and glorious theater was designed by world famous Scottish architect Thomas W. Lamb and was erected at the cost of $350,000. In 1986, the city of Brantford purchased the building for $425,000 to preserve Brantford's heritage and create a cultural center for the community. A group of dedicated volunteers spearheaded a highly successful fundraising campaign with support from the community and local businesses to restore the Capitol Theater. Over several years, the theater was reborn with an authentically restored auditorium and improved services for guests and performers. The Sanderson Center for the Performing Arts serves and develops for the community by delivering a balanced program of engaging entertainment, education, and cultural experiences that foster artistic growth. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit specifically about Woodland Cultural Center. Woodland has over 35,000 artifacts in our museum collection. The center is one of the largest facilities in Canada managed and administered by First Nations. It links the past to the present. Our art galleries present and celebrate indigenous achievement in classical and contemporary art. We exist to present and encourage and promote contemporary Indigenous art to all members of society. Showcasing the unique voice of Indigenous artists with exhibits that teach, provoke, and impact. We are a presenter of Indigenous artists, encouraging new works of contemporary art, and presenting these works for the enjoyment of all audiences. The Woodland Cultural Center has presented contemporary Indigenous artistic practices in all creative fields to local, national, and global audiences for over 40 years. The context in which works are presented at the Woodland Cultural Center is unique. As we are an indigenous run center with close ties to our three Ongwehome communities, the Woodland Cultural Center strives to be a presenter and advocate for all indigenous artists and their works. Today, we still run a performing arts series, which we have entitled, The Ongelon Nios. They are entertaining, which presents three multidisciplinary performing arts performances per year. So the Woodland Cultural Center and Sanderson Center have worked together on a number of collaborations and co-productions. I just wanted to highlight a few and discuss why these ones were of significant importance to this partnership. So one of the first co-productions that we undertook together was the opening night of Planet Indigenous. Now Planet Indigenous was a 10-day multidisciplinary Indigenous Contemporary Arts Festival, one of the largest in the world. And Woodland was hosting the opening night and we chose to host it at the Sanderson Center. It was a star-studded night with performances by Buffy St. Marie and Derek Miller, um, as well as some several opening night speeches. This opening night was spectacular and brought an almost sold out crowd 
which is roughly about 1,100 people in attendance. This was important as a co-production because the Sanderson Center didn't treat us as a facility rental. We worked together on collaborating on the marketing. We wanted to make sure that ticket sales were good and then we wanted a sold out crowd. So together we ensured that we were gonna have a successful opening night and both of us were ecstatic as re at the results. Following this event in 2017, we worked together on the presentation of the honoring. It is a dance production by local Six Nations choreographer, Santi Smith and her dance company, Gahawi Dance Theater. Glenn, Glenn and I spoke at length how hard it is to sell tickets for contemporary dance in our region. It is a genre that has struggled at both of our sites to sell out. And I said to him, we need to figure out a way to combine what the audiences like to hear and see with this genre. So I suggested, well, why doesn't Woodland uh, pay for a local musical artist who we chose was Logan Stotts uh, from Six Nations to open the show with a musical performance and we'll also bring some local partners um, to help us market the show and sell some tickets. Although it was still difficult to sell out this show, the wonderful production in itself and the coordination of our efforts really didn't go unnoticed. It was beautiful, it was poignant, and it was something that we knew it was gonna be a challenge, but we both said, we're in this, we're gonna get through it, and we're gonna find a way to make this a success. And it was. So another sort of collaboration we undertook in 2017 as well, and I'm not sure, I spoke a little bit about it in my introduction about Woodland Cultural Center, but I stated that it's on the grounds of the former Mohawk Institute Residential School. And Glenn reached out and suggested that Woodland and Sanderson work together on the tour of Fatty Lakes. Now, this is a performance uh, that would be presented as part of their S.C. Johnson family series. And for those of you who don't know what Fatty Legs is, it's a show that uses music, dance, and narration to tell the story of one little girl's experience in residential school. It's based on a true story. It brings to light great suffering, but at the same time celebrating the deep strength of a child who refused to be broken by her experiences. Uh, it was performed by the Zara Choral Theater and dancer Serene Carson Fox. It's based on a book uh, entitled Fatty Lakes by Margaret Pokiok Fenton and Christy Jordan Fenton. Um, the artwork in the book is beautiful. It's by Liz Amini Holmes and it was published by Anik Press. Glenn was aware that the Woodland Cultural Center was undertaking a massive fundraising campaign. It was called Save the Evidence. Uh, and this fundraise, fundraising campaign was set up to restore the former residential school building that had become quite dilapidated. And he thought, well, why don't, you know, we give your organization the opportunity to shed some light on your campaign. So we set up a booth to share information about residential school, but also about the campaign and seek out some donations. And before the performance, he also gave our Save the Evidence coordinator a few minutes to speak and talk about the Save the Evidence campaign. And I was ever so grateful that he was willing to say, okay, listen, you know, let's, let's shed some light on this. Let's also talk about a really important thing that you guys are undertaking at your center. And, you know, we'll have the space for you and we'll give you the opportunity to speak before, you know, a, a really great audience. And we were so appreciative because it sort of started to really kickstart and more and more people in the city of Brantford really started to hear about what our fundraising campaign was. But we also wanted to also contribute to, to the performance. So we spoke to Glenn and we said, well, what if we invite the choir and, um, the dancers, Serene Carson Fox, and their crew uh, to come take a special private tour of the residential school space. And they can see and hear firsthand experiences of the survivors who attended the Mohawk Institute Residential School and the ability to walk through the building and the space and to really 
give them that sense and that experience of what it would have been like to actually be a child attending one of these schools. Um, in the Q&A session following the performance, the, the choral theater and the dancer spoke about their experience of walking through that school, what it meant to them as well as performers trying to tell the story, really that, you know, it hit it home for them, that experience. So I was glad that we were able to also give something as well and share something with with uh, this amazing company who was doing this really emotional performance and to give them something and to also share that and give them that opportunity. Um, and Glenn was really, you know, thought that was a really great way to also participate as a, as a partner. So most recently, um, I was in a different position and I was the director of tourism and cultural initiatives at Six Nations. And I again connected with Glenn uh, to host a community outreach uh, portion of the tour of Australia's foremost contemporary Indigenous dance company, Bangara. I was so excited to find out that Bangara was going to be visiting our community at Six Nations and to be performing at the Sanderson Centre. I had been a fan for many years um, and I always missed when they were in residency at the Sydney Opera House. And I was so ecstatic when Glenn told me that you know, Bangara was going to be coming to Brantford, I thought, wow, like, I traveled across the world a few times to try and see them, and who would have thought they were going to be my, literally in my backyard. So, um, we had a few meetings uh, with their tour manager, and also with some of their outreach uh, team, and again, you know, we, we reiterated that contemporary dance is really hard to sell. It, you know, it's just something that's, hard for us to get community members to, to buy tickets for. So I brought my tourism team together and we did a massive outreach effort to ensure that we had people in seats. We did a major blitz work, working with a number of our community partners and together it was a great turnout. Glenn also helped supply some of the dance floor and installation at our community event um, where we invited uh, members of the community to participate in a master class and demonstration. And even though we had this random November snowstorm that day, uh, we still had a number of community and non-community members attend the event. It was a great day of cultural exchanges, sharing our traditional social dances from Six Nations in Australia. The next day, uh, the dancers from Bangara held dance workshops in our local elementary schools, and the children loved it. Um, this cultural exchange and performance was a lot of work, but as is the case for relationship building, so you have to put, you know, put the effort in. So that was just a little clip of uh, the cultural exchange that happened in our community space. And it was, it was amazing. We all gathered at the end over food and talked about our communities and the similarities between our indigenous peoples in Australia and Canada. It was just, it was, it was a heartwarming and really, really um, enlightening experience. So I wanna talk a little bit about how our partnership went beyond just being collaborators and co-producing partners. Um, there was also a deeper appreciation for cultural and professional development with both of our teams that Glenn and I really wanted to share. So on our way home from Curve Lake, Glenn and I spoke about cultural differences when it comes to artists and audiences from our two communities. It was interesting, although there are similarities, of course, I noticed there were some things that were unique to my community. I suggested maybe we do a team development at both of our sites. One day, his Sanderson team would come visit Woodland, and then on another day, my Woodland team would go visit Sanderson. So we set up some dates and encouraged all our team to participate. So when Sanderson's team came to visit Woodland, I took them around our site, gave them a tour of our museum and our grounds, and I shared some cultural protocols when it comes to Indigenous audiences and artists. I pointed out that in many Indigenous communities, yes, you see similarities, but they're also very different. So it's important to understand that it is somewhat detrimental to make generalizations and it's important to understand each indigenous community's history, culture, and spirituality. 
I spoke about the protocols we use at Six Nations and particularly at how we run events at Woodland. We always open and close our events with the Ginyo or the Thanksgiving address. We ensure that elders are seated first and most of our events are family based. So it's not uncommon to have small children and babies in the audience. And although those might not seem like major things, they are very important to my community. On our visit um, to the Sanderson Center, Glenn showed us around the space. And for many of my team members, it was the first time they ever stepped foot in the Sanderson Center. They were intrigued by the history of the building. Uh, they were so interested in the technical side of the productions, the backstage, um, some of the unique features they have at their front of house, definitely things that we don't have access to um, at our site. We also talked about, you know, ensuring that you have a space for Indigenous artists in a non-Indigenous performing space where, you know, if Indigenous artists would like to smudge the stage beforehand or their space, um, that those would be made available. So I don't want to underline how important it is to understand that it will take a lot of time, a lot of hard work, and a lot of listening to one another to cultivate a partnership. Glenn and I regularly still meet up for coffee and tea. Even during COVID, we would do it over Zoom. We continually talk about our programming visions and we also share some of our challenges. Glenn has become a wonderful sounding board for me. He assists me when I'm frustrated or I, I have an issue and I need someone to help me problem solve. And he's also a really great colleague. And I would say he's become one of, a, one of my good friends. We still learn something new from one another every time we talk. We talk a little bit about what the future will hold for performing arts because it seems very unknown right now. But what I do know is this. It took Glenn and I traveling in a car together for three hours to realize that we had a lot to share with one another and to start that relationship between an Indigenous and non-Indigenous organization. We were both open to listening and learning from one another. And if anything, that is the first step. I hope that this has helped some of you out there wondering what to do and how to do the real work. All I can say is this, it takes time. It takes being honest and being open. And at the end of the day, if you really wanna make a difference, you just need to make the effort. I wanna thank you all for spending time with me today to hear about the collaboration that Woodland has with the Sanderson Center. I wanna thank you for being present and willing to learn. And I hope that this experience will help you in the future. Ona and see you soon.